So I am Ewan Burney, and my current position is Director of Emble EBI. Um, it's worth, if anybody's you know, going to look at this, my name, my first name, Ewan, is actually a sort of family nickname that gets given. So I'm actually formerly John Frederick William Burney. And Ewan is the nickname that everybody uses me by. So Ewan Burney is very much my scientific ma name. My legal name is John Frederick William Burney. So I was born in London in uh, 1972, uh, December the 6th, 1972. So there probably was a guy called Bob Stevenson. I went to, I, w I did an English um, uh, private education, what is called public school in England, which is obviously, you know, the interpretation is quite the opposite, so privately funded, and to Eton College. And at Eton, there was a guy called Bob Stevenson who was a really good teacher and scientist. And he, he fired me up, for sure, uh, in biology. Um, and he was responsible at the time, we'll come on to, you know, at the time, Jim Watson, who's basically a, a tremendous Anglophile. I mean, he absolutely loves all things traditionally English. Uh, Jim had, um, I think, gone to Eton and, and talked to some of the teachers there and seen and been entertained by some of the boys and uh, decided to take a boy every year from Eton to work in what's called a gap year, which is a very, which you'll know, is sort of traditional English uh, year that you spend between 18, after school and before university, one takes a year out. So he made an offer to do that, and Bob Stevenson was responsible for selecting the boy. So rather than there being some process, it was just basically Bob's choice and uh, Bob suggested me, uh, so when I was 19, I ended up at Cosmic Harbor, living with Jim Watson and working with Adrian Craner. Okay. So, it, so it was, I mean, again, when you're 19, it's, you know, there's, um, uh, you're not aware of quite how uh, odd and unique the situation is and slightly strange, so I lived in Jim Watson's house with Liz, Jim's wife, and Jim there, sort of in loco parentis. His eldest son, Rufus, was also there in the house at the same time. It's very nice. Um, you would, I wouldn't spend too much time necessarily talking, but, you guys, um, but we still exchange Christmas cards or whatever with Jim and Liz, um, even now. Um, and I'd walk in from, they have a lovely house, the top end of Cosmic Harbor, the director's house, and I would walk in every day and go to the lab. Um, and Cosmic Hub was really, really fun, uh, a really enjoyable experience. Um, and that also showed you just sort of how s open science, well, so I hadn't appreciated just how many unknown things there were. And so working in a lab where suddenly you're testing things and you have to work things out and everything else was really, really cool. I was only 19. It was a great privilege. When I was there in Adrian Craner's lab, who studies RNA splicing, really the databases had started to get big, and people needed ways of searching them and looking at things. And, um, and so I taught myself to program um, in that year. Um, and a very lovely guy called Sanjay Kumar, um, uh, when I said, please, you know, can I, you know, how do I do this? And he was a programmer. I knew he was a programmer. And he said he bought me this uh, the famous C book, this very thin book about how to program in C. And I taught myself. Um, and so my first paper was with Adrian before I went to university, um, which is a very small paper about the presence of RNA binding domains in a particular protein that people didn't think had them. And we, we sort of just, it was basically an alignment by hand. But my second paper, which was far, far more substantial, uh, came about in my first year at university, but I was still communicating with Adrian about this. Um, and that paper, which was on the RNA recognition motif, I mean, it still gets cited now a little bit, which is kind of cool. Um, and it was, you know, it was a, it was a, it was a good paper. Uh, so that was a good thing to do. So I must have started that paper when I was 19, and it was published when I was 20 published in my first year at university. So, so it's definitely, it, and you know, so obviously it gave me a, 
in some sense, in just a sort of timing sense, a huge head start. But I think the other key thing it really gave me was um, this, this a, a far better understanding of how science is done. So that, that what you read in the textbook wasn't necessarily what was right. That you know that when knowledge is founded by experiments and discussion and everything else. And I had a really, really great time. I mean, being British in America, your accent makes you sound like you're, you know, you've got 10 plus IQ points. Um, uh, I worked really, really hard at Cosmic Harbor, and then I'd either go out in New York City, or uh, a friend of mine from Eton had gone to Harvard and at the same time, and he hadn't done a gap yet, so he'd gone straight to Harvard. So I'd take the train all the way up to Boston and hang out with him up in uh, Boston for a weekend, and then I'd come back down again. Um, so it was a really, uh, really fun time. The other thing that I remember very distinctly is, um, you know, talks. When people came in to give a talk at Cosmic Harbor, um, everybody would gather, um, and one scientist, Winship Herb, would, um, you know, as soon as he didn't understand a slide, he'd put his hand up and say, you know, I don't understand what you're showing on this slide. And uh, he did it in a way where I think he, he didn't do it. He did it because he wanted to, he wanted to understand what the, what the other person was doing. He didn't mind looking a bit stupid. Sometimes um, uh, he really didn't care about that. Um, he just wanted to make sure that he was following all the slides. And again, I, it's something that, seeing really, really high-end scientists feeling happy to ask stupid questions is, was a, is a good attitude to have to those talks. You know, can, do I understand everything that's being presented uh, at this time? So it's a, good, it's a kind of good rigor to have in your own head. You know, have they done all the controls? Has it been set up with the right fundamental thing behind it, basically? Yeah. So Adrian Craner, who ran the lab in Cosby Harbor, I mean, again, I think it's remarkable to think about someone who let a 19-year-old come into their lab and then by the end of that year write a paper with them and then in the next year write a second paper with them. And that shows a lot of, um, you know, I think I... Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure everybody would 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 sort of encourage that to happen, um, and let me follow my own uh, approach in this computational work that Adrian wasn't necessarily so strong about, but could understand what was going on underneath. So Adrian was really really good. And then in Oxford, the Oxford system is four years, and the fourth year you have to do your own project. And an NMR spectroscopist called Ian Campbell. At, at that time, I had published. So I published a paper in, um, in my first year. And then my second year, I actually went to Embel Heidelberg, which is, in fact, now my parent organization that I work at, and worked with a guy called Toby Gibson. Um, and I wrote a second paper there called Pairwise and Searchwise. And that is the precursor to a lot of my algorithms. Uh, so I spent a whole summer, basically, in Germany, in uh, hot Heidelberg. Uh, working with Toby, and I, I published two more papers then with Toby over my time. And then in my fourth year, I went to Ian Campbell and effectively said, please, you know, I think I know what I'm doing with my own research. I have my own, you know, I've got four publications already or something like that. Um, could you just let me fool around, you know, can I just have a computer? All I need is a computer uh, and space, and then that's fine. And uh, you can, you know, be my supervisor. I'll, I'll obviously talk to you. Um, and he said, fine. And at that point, I knew that I wanted to do more things with databasing and more things around sequence analysis. And the only open source database at the time was written by Richard Durbin and Jean Thierry Meek um, called ACDB. So I wrote off, I wrote email to, at that point, I had done all these profile things. I wrote an email to Richard saying, please, can I come and learn how to use this. Um, and so he invited me, and I also gave a talk about my profile work, and I'd actually done, I had mis, un, mis uh, I had incorrectly implemented 
an algorithm because I'd sort of taught myself all the way through. So I'd done something quite interesting in pairwise and searchwise, which wasn't quite correct. Um, uh, but um, Richard Durbin and Sean Eddy was a postdoc there. And again, they both, you know, they sort of, I think, found my um, self-taughtness of computational, you know, of these methods really quite interesting. So that was my fourth year at Oxford. And at the end of my fourth year of Oxford, I had to decide whether I was what I was going to do. Um, and a couple of extra things here. So my father is an investment banker. And, uh, yeah, and my uncle is, uh, was an electron scientist my, microscopist. My, my, and that was my uncle on my mother's side. And my father basically was rather skeptical that I would make a good career. That he felt that I was over-focused on science. He felt that you know, I was, I was doing well, but I, I hadn't, you know, that I was going to choose this because it was interesting and then regret it in 10 years' time because it didn't have enough money, basically. I mean, not, not that he's very money orientated, but he, he worried that I was closing down my options too quickly. So at the same time, I spent, I did a summer working for an investment bank um, where I did all sorts of fun things, including option pricing. And there was actually, I got quite close. It never happened, but it got, I got quite close to spotting something that they would have created an option around, uh, which was kind of cool, you know, one of these exotic options. So that was one summer. I was mainly in equity research on pharmaceuticals there. And then, in fact, the year after my after Oxford, I spent a summer working for the mayor of Baltimore, uh, uh, here just up the road in Baltimore, uh, which was a big education in kind of American life and politics and American politics. I mean, obviously not very scientific at all. So both of those were slightly to prove to myself and prove to my father that I was making a good decision to stay in science. Um, and at the time, the Wellcome Trust had something called prize studentships, um, which was really designed, I think, for people like me, where, where rather than... So I did, I, I, I applied to being an investment bank after going and working in the city. I, I you know, went to Goldman's, I went to SBI. I had offers, uh, not from Goldman's, but from a whole bunch of investment banks. Um, so, and... I think if there was just a straight British salary MRC star studentship, where really you had us, you know, it wasn't enough to live on at all. It was pretty, I don't think I'd have gone for it. But the Wellcome Trust Prize Studentship was healthy enough that you could live and, you, you know, you could have a car and, you know. Anyway, so I, I, uh, I said yes to the uh, Wellcome Trust Studentship uh, with Richard. And... And so that's, that's how I got to Sanger and working with Richard, basically. Right. So, I mean, he's one of my, he's still one of my collaborators. I mean, it's really interesting now being whatever, mid-40s, thinking about that. Because, of course, I sort of started knowing of him in my 20s and then working as a, as a student um, whenever I was 24 or something like that. Uh, but he's a remarkable guy, Richard. You should get an oral history from him. Um, so he it was a mathematician from Cambridge. Um, he's got these curious things. I think he had a basketball scholarship um, that he came to Harvard for or something like that. He was a basketball player, a volleyball player, something like that. Um, and I, you know, maths in Cambridge is the highest level. And, and I think he was, I mean, he's, he's an excellent mathematician, but he's not one of those... Uh, pure mathematicians. And so he had to slightly decide precisely what he was going to do. And one of the things he was doing, and I can't remember quite how this worked with his undergraduate or his graduate work, was that he started doing confocal microscopy. He programmed the confocal micro microscopy software and stuff like that. I think that was before he did his PhD. And then he did his PhD with John Salston. Um, and that was very much to bring computation and neural networks alongside the C. elegans developing brain. And I think he mapped out all the, or many of the neuronal connections of C. elegans, which is for a, somebody who's a maths person, that's a 
that's a pretty big journey already. And John Solston had a, obviously a passion for the worm, but a passion for genomes and a passion for getting these things done. And so as the worm genome project was coming up, it was kind of clear that they needed information systems to do that. And I'm, I'm not sure how this happened, but somehow Richard met and started working with this slightly mad Frenchman called Jean Thierry Meek, who always came with his wife, so there's sort of this husband-wife, uh, Danielle, uh, pair. And Jean Thierry Meek was an ex-physicist, and Richard and Jean Thierry Meek, Jean, um, uh, wrote an open source database. Now, these days we'd call it a document-orientated semi-structured database. At that time, they just wrote something that worked <laughs> uh, 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 for, for, for all of this, yeah. Um, and, uh, and it's going to look, you know, it looks very clunky now. Um, and you've got to remember that this was just as Oracle, the, the database company Oracle was coming up and selling Oracle for massive amounts of money. And no academic would ever uh, afford that. And also before the web. And actually, their database was an open source database before the MySQLs and the other famous open source databases came through. Um, and it also had the concept of hyperlinks um, uh, inside of the system of HTTP. It had an integrated graphical interface with the database. And so pre-web, you had this rather amazing thing. And in fact, back in Adrian Craner's lab, I remember, so there's this year I did as my gap year. The next summer, I came back to Cosmic Harbor as an ERP. And in that summer, we installed HDB on their Sun machine. And I remember you know, getting it up for something that's absolutely amazing. Um, so Richard wrote that piece of software for the Worm project and, and basically was, has been this common thread through the Worm Genome Project and then the Human Genome Project. Um, and then, in fact, into the hat map and then the thousand genomes and everything else of what, what, where his real skills are is, is algorithms and understanding what one should do with sequence data. He also practically, he did write this database and he practically did a number of things. There was a period when I was a student with Richard where the Sanger really ran on his software and occasionally you know, things would break, and Richard was the only person who could go and fix it, and he would have to go and fix it. And it was all not how you would run a system now. Um, but he's a, he's a total legend. Um, his algorithmic, his maths and algorithms is just really top notch, and his understanding of biology. And so it was a real pleasure. I mean, it was a real experience actually working with him. It was the first time I had. You know, I had been self-taught, and I had been the best programmer, sort of, or the best person up to then. And then I met Richard, and then it was very clear that there, there was, you know, uh, uh, somebody better, yeah, exactly, somebody better than me at, at all of these things. So it was, it was, uh, that was, uh, you know, it was, it was, it was great. Um, and in my PhD, I both did a practical thing, practical things, and I did very kind of algorithmic things. So my PhD, the practical things, was running the PFAM database, which was also slightly kind of, it was all, you know, you, again, you just wouldn't do it this way now. I mean, it's sort of, it was generally chaotic, not chaotic, but, you know, kind of Heath Robinson-like uh, approach to these things. Um, and at the same time, I was focusing on developing algorithms, which I had thought about from pairwise and searchwise and sort of generalizing those algorithms and to, to, to sort of match how the maths worked with how the algorithm worked, I wrote my own little miniature programming language. Now, again, because of my sort of slightly self-taughtness, this was very poorly, it's not a good piece of computer science. Um, however, uh, it did um, elevate uh, dynamic programming, which is the key, um, you call me key sequence alignment methods, it sort of elevated that as a first class uh, language primitive. And um, so I was able to write far more complicated algorithms. I think I probably still am able to write far more complicated algorithms 
uh, and just you know throw them around, change things, test things, you know, do things in different ways, and then know that my programming language would accurately generate all the right code for it, so I didn't have to worry about debugging it and things like that. Uh, as well as it being kind of practical for the for the final set of algorithms that I wrote, it actually gave me huge amounts of freedom to to experiment. And and that that algorithm, you know, the the best algorithm that came out from that it was an algorithm called GeneWise, which takes a protein sequence and matches it to the genome, but it, but sort of handles splicing and handles errors. And in my thesis, my my major part of the thesis was about the language, which was called Dynamite. There's only one user, that's me, really. There was a second user, but she didn't. Unsurprisingly, it's one of those things where there's really only one user, which is the person who created in the first place. But actually, I think there's a lot of computer science like that. I think a lot of computer scientists end up, it's actually a very interesting debate about how you provide abstraction. Because, um, uh, you know, ultimately, you, you know, when you start realizing, oh, I could write my own computer language that does this, and very often that starts off by writing itself, writing a different lower level computer language like C. And that's, that's the major thing that Dynamite did. But actually, I did go all the way to producing things that, where I could manipulate everything. So although I didn't never wrote assembly compilers, I got quite close because I tried to target it to different architectures where I had, I had a different set of primitives to use. Yeah? Um, so that was, you know, that was kind of fun, uh, obviously. But the, 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 the practical thing that came out was GeneWise, which took a protein sequence, say, from mouse or from rat, and could map it to a genome, but of a different species, say, of human. I could deal with the fact that the splicing, you didn't know where the splice pattern was, and you didn't know where errors were. Um, and that algorithm ended up being, you know, the, the most robust algorithm for predicting genes in the human genome, which was a big topic of conversation at the time. Um, it was extortionately computationally expensive, um, uh, but very robust, and, and did a better job than nearly anything, and is still running today. At the end of my PhD, obviously, the, so the worm genome was chugging along very, very well at Sanger. It was very clear it's going to work. And next door to us were the people analyzing the worm genome, which they did a lot, effectively, not by, not sort of in a, in a computer-assisted, but fundamentally by hand way. Mm -hmm. um, and there was a project to sort of do a similar thing on the human genome, kind of match, you know, match for the flow, rate of flow coming through the genome project. Remember that the human genome project was was projected to finish in 2010 or something like that, with a pretty nice, slow, steady beat all the way across the genome. Um, so it's sort of halfway through, or, or close, yeah, halfway through, uh, Solera happened. And it was this kind of, you know, explosion of fear and excitement for the, um, the Sanger Institute. You know, excitement that this, that this, that, you know, the Sanger Institute was, or the Sanger Center at the time, was one of the most important parts of, you know, it was sort of validation that this was an incredibly important project. And so everybody got quite excited about that, that there was this you know, slightly mad American raising money in the stock market and doing all of this um, stuff. Um, but then there was this sort of awful realization that everything would have to speed up. And, um, you know, so one, one had to work through how one sped everything up. And some things were quite easy and other things were very unobvious about how that was going to work out. And so there's a whole kind of saga here about, about moving away from a mapping first approach to a sequence backs as they come through um, uh, and stuff like that. And I wasn't in the middle of it, but I could see the kind of, you know, you, could, you knew that that debate was happening and how that was, was changing. What was interesting, as they accelerated the speed of doing this, the public project, and making announcements that they would accelerate and match sort of Solera's run rate to this, then Solera was also saying, well, that's great. We'll use the public data. That's all wonderful. Of course, the public people don't know how to analyze it. So everybody's going to be coming to Solera anyway, um, because 
because we've got the brains. And they had this, you know, very, very clever um, computational scientist called Gene Myers, who was the person who originally sort of said that it was feasible to do the assembly. And he was a, a good friend of Richard Durbin's, actually, just to go back. You know, there's a, another thing, despite all the kind of nastiness between the Solera project and the public project, especially in the computational end, there was a lot more sort of mutual respect of, 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 uh, of each other. I'll come back to that uh, through this. So, so anyway, so it became clear that we had to have a solution to the analysis. We, or Sanger, had to have a solution to the, the analysis. And then three kind of things came together around that. So one was um, someone who Richard had hired to take over the running of the human annotation. That was Tim Hubbard. And he had seen this, and he had created an even more extremely Heath Robinson system um, to, than, than the PFAM thing, to try and keep track of all the bits of DNA that was being sequenced publicly and run it through some very, very basic analyses. Same time, he had hired Michelle Clamp, and Michelle, I'd known, she had been a postdoc with Jeff Barton, who I'd known from Oxford. So I'd known them because of my undergraduate at Oxford, and I knew that there was this sort of slightly physics woman who could code really well, and she had somehow done great things with Jeff. And so she, they, she and her then boyfriend, James Cuff, got hired to the EBI, and she got hired from the EBI to, um, to Sanger to help run some of this annotation stuff as well. And me and Michelle and James really hit it off, actually, as in terms of we all wanted to just like you know, make new things happen. And so there was a combination of um, me and Michelle also thought that ACDB really wasn't going to work for, the, for, the, for this. It just wasn't going to scale. And so we got this newfangled thing, MySQL, which nobody knew whether it was really robust enough and stable enough and was up to the job. We brought that in-house. At the same time, Sanger had brought in Oracle in-house to run its major database thing, also realizing that HDB really wasn't the sort of long-term solution. That was a kind of annoyed Richard, because to be fair to Richard, lots of things of HDB worked well, but some things just worked awfully, absolutely awfully. And you know, so there was this sort of massive write lock on the database. It was just, a, just not going to work. Um, so we brought in the, this uh, MySQL, and Michelle and I were effectively exploring how to make a database schema for genomics. And I was exploring, I had written GeneWise, and I had, was you know, getting more and more confident that that was, you know, that, that any prediction that came through GeneWise was going to be pretty good, almost certainly correct, Asterisks, except for pseudogene predictions. Uh, so there's a there is an asterisk there um, uh, uh, for this. And then this need to respond to Solera kind of drove the this next phase of us really creating um, something. And this was just as I started my PhD was about to finish. And so another slightly complicated thing to this. Oh God! So you see, this is why, this is why oral history is a good idea. Um, so I'd written this programming language called Dynamite, and I was thinking about targeting it to different machine architectures, not just my own architect, not just standard C programming. And there was a company called Paracel, whose major customer was the NSA um, for text mining and stuff like that. And they had identified DNA matching as their other big opportunity. And my code, uh, pairwise and searchwise and then genewise, was probably was incredibly computationally intensive, but worked directly off DNA. Most things didn't do that. And, and was, was clearly good, it was clearly a really sensible thing to do. And so they, they really felt that was a match made in heaven. So they flew me over to. California a number of times. Oh, and at the same time, 
I was also doing the same thing with an Israeli company called CompuGen. It also done alternative hardware. So I was going to Israel to help see how my programming language could work with CompuGen, and I was going to California to see how it works with Parasol. And because of that, and it was the dot-com boom, and then, then I was invited to be on the Paracel's scientific advisory board. And I was, you know, I was kind of a kid then. But the other person on that scientific advisory board was Gene Myers. So we, we were the two computational people. Uh, and then there were a couple of other people. And this was, it was an independent company at the time. So I had a lot of good interactions with Gene on the scientific advisory board and discussing how one does dynamic programming and, you know, or less how one does the algorithm and more what it's useful and how to construct it and how to make, how to do different, um, different things. So as I ended up my PhD, it was very clear to me that it was a bit unclear what I would do next, but I had lots of options. And it was the dot-com boom era. And, you know, Solera had founded with lots of money and there's, you know, so startups and all sorts of different things. So I took myself off and went around America and I visited all sorts of places. Solera, I visited Solera for a job. I visited Parasol for a job. I visited academic labs. I went to, I went to all sorts of different places. And... Um, uh, somehow my last one was Paracel, and I remember them, s you know, giving me a job offer for more money than I ever thought was sensible to give to a scientist. And I kind of, I, I, I sort of said to myself, I'm, you know, I'm going to take this job. This is my opportunity. And then I said, no, no, look, look, I better go home, talk through with my girlfriend, who's now my wife, a little bit about that, uh, and also just, just go home and talk with my <laughs> Talk, talk it over before I signed on the dotted line. So after this sort of week and a half, this was still the height of the human genome sort of stuff, you know. And so it's quite surprising when, you know, there's this whole narrative about people, you know, throwing shit at each other publicly through press releases, and yet a perfectly pleasant uh, um, uh, and, and collegial conversations between many members of the science scientists in the different parts of the project. So there, there's a quite a funny contrast of, of that. I think there is a very particular Sanger and Wellcome Trust view as well. I, I think that I, I personally think already there are alternative histories being written about some of this because I think it is, it is true that John at some point got the backing that if necessary, the Wellcome Trust would finance the Sanger to do all of it. True. And for John, I think that was an incredibly important thing that he could then come to all of these conversations and say, it does not matter what you guys de decide, we will do X, Y, and Z, yeah? Um, and I think that, you know, how important those that is is quite an interesting question, yeah? Uh, but it's, as part of the Wellcome Trust Sanger mythology, you know, if, if, uh, if that commitment hadn't been made and if John hadn't made those statements, uh, there was potentially a different uh, branching pattern for, uh, for what happened next. You know, I think that, so anyway, going back to, so the geeks were, were so we got on, I think, well, and so I'd gone around all of these different places and, before I'd left, Richard said, Richard said to me, Le, we want to keep you at Sanger, and why don't you run the mouse annotation group, which was going to be two people, and wasn't kind of the heat of the problem, which was the human annotation stuff. And I kind of said, you know, I don't, I'm not sure I really want to do that, and I, I went around. So when I came back, Richard was incredibly keen to almost immediately talk to me, and he sort of almost physically dragged me off to the EBI to talk to Graham Cameron. Um, and, Graham, and Graham and Richard, in, sort of in the time there, had cooked up the idea that EBI would offer me a position and back half of the annotation project. And um, that was what triggered the ensemble project being a joint project between EBI and Sanger and the commitment for um, 
of of EMBL was really some money, but also making me a PI. So I became a PI. I actually became a PI before I got my PhD, um, which was a little bit like I got appointed to a, 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 a EMBL before I got my PhD. There were, there's this letter from Fretis Kafatos that says basically, if you don't submit your PhD in the next month, then you know this is going to you know. You know, uh, the, you, you, you know that's, yeah, it's, it's kind of, yeah, things are going to explode. Things. Awful things will happen. Um, and at the time, we were building up to one, to the big Tony Blair, what ends up being the, the uh, announcement thing. So this was sort of, this was January before that announcement. And so I was working like an idiot with Michelle and other people in trying to get everything to work. And then, you know, and then in the evening, I was be trying to finish off my PhD. It was just excruciating. But anyway, that all worked out. So we got, we set up Ensemble, and then we also realized that it had to be funded. So we had a meeting with, uh, <laughs> with uh, yeah, exactly. We had a meeting with uh, Welcome Trust kind of in the back of the room. And so the first thing is we did a number of proposals, and our first proposal had something like eight people. And John came back with this, so almost like I remember the one, almost one line email that said double it. And so we rated for 16, and John said, double it again. And so we rated for 25 or something like that, which was a huge grant. I mean, you know, you know, when most people, it's just, what are you doing? So, you know, it's now a team of about 45 people. I now am totally used to the idea that this kind of engineering requires quite a lot of, it just requires a lot of personnel and muscle and stuff like that. Um, and we had a meeting with the great and the good there. And again, it's one of those cases where the Wellcome Trust clearly had to take a risk. I mean, if it had gone through normal peer review, it would have just been torn into lots of little pieces, plus the fact that it has 25 people to it. Yeah? Mm. Um, you know, no, no panel would have, would have swallowed that uh, um, at, at the time, especially with a, someone who was straight out as a graduate student. I mean, it's ridiculous. But uh, nobody really knew what to do, and they, they knew there wasn't enough computational biologists, and they knew that I had a lot of kind of, you know, self-delivered you know, delivered, uh, by hook or by crook, by persuading, you know, all sorts of different things. Um, and we, there were four, three or four PIs, Richard, Graham, myself and Tim Hubbard. And it's to my regret that Michelle Clamp wasn't a named PI. I think that's right. Because um, uh, I think it's quite easy. I see Ensemble being founded by Tim, Michelle, and myself. Um, and the fact that Michelle was sort of under Tim was, uh, was always a bit of a something slightly wrong about that setup. Anyway. So Ensemble started up, and that gave us then uh, a, a very big, um, you know, effort. We and we and we really did deliver that and make that happen over time. Um, so if you look back at it again, it looks clunky, um, but a lot of the, for example, the fundamental, you know, the fundamental data model that we had was. Um, especially of the genes, transcripts, proteins. I mean, it's all obvious stuff, but it's actually the, the you know, it's, it's stood the test of time, the same concepts hang around, basically. Um, and gene-wise, for example, was right in the middle of the gene prediction. Um, but Michelle's code as well about how you call gene-wise, how you make it, how, where you do it, how you call it, where you do it, how you tidy up afterwards, which is a key part of the whole process, still, I think, is almost the same uh, now as it was way back then. I can't remember which Colesman Harbour this was. So this was 2000, I think. Yes, it was 2000. And it was very clear that there was, a, one session was all about gene prediction. And I was there explaining ensemble and gene wise and stuff like that. Um, Jean Weissenbach and Hugues Roast Credius from um, Genoscope were sequencing Takifugu. Or, um, uh, or Tetrodon, I can't remember which one, and was very smart. And they had used those reads to estimate the number of genes in the human genome. And they had come out with this shockingly low number, 
Um, and it was already kind of rumoured before we had the, the actual session in Cold Spring Harbour that, that this was going to happen. And um, if you remember, I did spend some time in this investment bank. If you spend time with traders, you discover that, that you, you know, they bet on anything and everything. You know, anything you can bet on, they will bet on. Um, and uh, back then, I, you, you know, it teaches you a lot about running markets. So I actually ran a book once for, a, a, so be the bookie to, to uh, a, um, go kart racing you know, uh, uh, with just people. And it's, it's actually very, very interesting when you're the bookie rather than the per person betting, because you have to offer odds which are long enough to attract bets. And short enough, you, you know, so there's, you, there's this, fr as soon as you run a book, you have this phrase being over round or under round. And you also want to be over round. Over round meaning that you win no matter uh, where, who wins the, the race. You, the, 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 yeah, no matter the outcome, exactly. And that's basically traders have to be in a, you know, you want to be in an over round situation, not in a situation where you're, you're asking for, for results to go your way. So I, I'd had that experience. So I realized that it would be fun to do this. And I, there was a time when I wondered whether I should kind of offer odds. But I realized that wouldn't work uh, um, at all. It was pretty clear that you, know, you couldn't offer odds on the number of, of, um, uh, of genes. So I set it up as a sweepscape. Um, and I didn't realize this, but Francis Collins had the same idea and was a bit pissed off that I had, I had, I had uh, suggested this. Um, but I just sort of waved this book in the air. And of course, it was at Cosmic Harbor, so I had gone to Adrian Craner's lab and said, could I, could I just have a lab notebook? And I pasted, you know, Gene Sweet, whatever. And that no so I had great fun um, that night. I um, so I had to write down the rules of the bet, um, uh, and then take on bets. And we, I decided this was all decided sort of on the hoof that that uh, you could buy an one. So this was the only sort of fun thing, slightly different thing I did is you could buy one number for one dollar on on the first year. So it's going to be decided in two thousand three, and then it was going to be five dollars a bet on the second year. And then twenty dollars a bet on the third year, and the fourth year we would decide. Um, and so that's all written in there. So the idea being that the information was much better as you got later in this. But it was a great, you know. I think lots of pe I met lots of people. Lots of people remember me because I was there. I was this young Brit. I, I used to swear a lot as well. I was a much more sort of dirty mouth at the time. Young Brit, um, precocious. Uh, doing this, and then I came around with this book and persuaded effectively everybody in the meeting to put a dollar in and put a number in. And um, of course, the, the the really amusing thing about it is that everybody was wrong. I mean, everybody was was absolutely horribly. Everybody overestimated the number, and it shows you that when. The crowds with no data, you know, so, so <laughs> crowds with data probably will make a good estimate. Crowds with no data absolutely don't make a good, a good estimate. We just, we were all doing it from, you know, sort of, sort of crappy back law and stuff like that. And don't forget that Insight was around as an EST company, and they were selling access to 100,000 human genes. So, it was considered to be quite radical to put down 50,000. You were really saying that <laughs> the, insight, <laughs> the, you know, the, the insight was lying, basically, to put down that kind of number. And for Oog to get up and say there are 26,000 protein coding genes in the human genome, I mean, you know, people thought he was a mad Frenchman. I mean, it was just, I mean, I mean people really genuinely thought he had lost it uh, at some level for there to be that low number. So. By the time we got to, so the interesting thing is Oog put down his estimate, which was, I can't remember what it was, it was like 26,200. And a couple of people realizing the sweepstakes rules sensibly went below Oog, but only two people went below Oog, which is, when you think about it, very poor strategizing by, you know, there's probably 500 votes, yeah? yeah it's two. And it's only two that go below, that who don't go down, yeah? So, um, so we, when we came to 2003, and by the rules of the bet, we should settle it. Um, 
And, and actually, the, num the number still wasn't known at the time. And in fact, if you wouldn't actually have a number now, you'd have a range, a band, which would be above 19,500, below 20,500, yeah? With a lot of kind of definitional stuff going on. So, uh, so we decided in 2003, or the suggestion was, is that the, the pot was split three ways between the, the last two people in Oog and Lee Rowan um, from Seattle. She actually had the lowest, lowest bet, so she kind of won. Um, but I really give Oog the, the biggest and the most amount of credit. I mean, nobody was down there except for the fact that Oog was down there. If Oog hadn't gone down there, nobody would have written uh, a bet below 30,000, I think, um, uh, which is kind of interesting, for sure. Yeah, so that's the story of the Gene Suite. It also, I met lots and lots of people um, uh, at Cosmic Harbor there. The human genome, the draft human genome was the first time we'd done anything of that scale in terms of genomics. And it was the first time we'd done this big consortia sort of method. And, uh, and it showed that it was the first time the, the analysis showed, the paper structure showed, whatever. By the time we got to the mouse genome, it was better, far better. By the time you got from the mouse genome to the chicken genome, even better. You know, we really honed it by the end. So it was done um, in an ad hoc way, for sure. Uh, an absolutely key individual here, uh, and again, I really hope you get his oral, oral history as well as Jim Kent. Um, because, you know, that, you know, without, so David Hassel and I, and some, and I think Jim, on one of the Cosmic Harbors, and I, d I don't know if it was 2000 or 1999, there's a whole business of putting together the human genome, and even how one thought about an assembly. And so we had this thing called a golden path, which was a concept from Phil Green in his assembler, which was a golden path of reeds, and we, we sort of took that up into an assembly uh, concept. And a very early version of GeneWire, of, of Ensemble, allowed simultaneously different golden paths to exist, so different alternative assemblies. So that our very first design, Michelle and mine, very first design had this. And, um, you know, actually these days, so somebody, you know, people talk about this now for graph genomes, the idea of having flexible more than one assembly with the same backbones and stuff like that. I mean, we've never really done uh, done it here. And it was quite funny that we wrote, wrote the system at the start to do that. And in fact, we end up throwing away that part and just dealing with a, a single linear reference. I'm slightly sad that we did that, but still. Yeah. Um, so Jim was absolutely key in doing this. And in some ways, it, it, it became clear that Jim was making this wonderful browser. We were as academics are, competing and collaborating in some sense at the same time. And he had thought through a way of making the assembly. And so Michelle and I focused on making genes. And then, you know, putting the paper together, the person who really made the, who sort of drummed, made a drum beat for the paper was Eric Lander, for sure. There were many people sort of around him, so John Salston and Bob Waterston were sort of with him, but Eric was the person who wanted to put his fingers in everything uh, during the analysis. And he kind of called, and I think he gave the name Hardcore Analysis Group, uh, was from him. And, you know, I think that's both because of his enthusiasm and his desire to control, so that, you know, both of those things are wrapped up together. Um, and so th we, that's how that kind of process happened. And then there were, there were always these phone calls to coordinate the production of the genome. And then there came a, another run of phone calls around the analysis. Mm -hmm. Michelle and I and Tim would go to the G5 calls uh, occasionally, uh, but those were always very focused on production. production yeah. And it became more and more obvious as things developed that we needed a separate thing that was more analysis focused, and that's that's how the hardcore analysis thing came. Now there was a meeting I remember going to Boston when you know when it wasn't the Broad, it was still the Whitehead, and in in that kind of their funny semi-factory-like building, it was all snowy, um, 
and I, I sort of remember that as one of the first physical get-togethers of all these analyst-style people. Um, but it was a real raggle-taggle bunch of people. Um, and when you read the analysis, it's, it's not very good. Um, and I think you've got to be honest about it. <laughs> I, you know, we were, it was the first time we did it, but it's not really very good. To, in our defense, the Solera analysis wasn't very good either. Um, and the Solera analysts were also using GeneWise, for example, in the middle of their pipeline. <laughs> so um, um, and there's this whole hoo-ha, less, more for this Tony Blair, Craig Venter, you know, uh, Bill Clinton announcement about the number of human genes, yeah? And, um, and that led into, it was all sort of wrapped up in the same thing as this sort of betting book thing. And, um, you know, that, that was a great example where I was tempted to send a little message to Mark Yandal at Solera and say, okay, what number have you got? Let's, why don't we just agree, you know, together so that we're not totally out of whack? Because there's this huge fear that we would, you know, Michelle and I were making estimates in the 20,000, which we call 20,000 confident human genes. And we're basically being told that that number looked too low. And, um, I remember Michelle's first estimate was up, up in sort of, it was about 24,000, whatever, and we felt it was too low. And then when we presented it, one of the G's five calls, it was too low. Like, Solero is going to, you know, it was, this is going to be awful. We're going to look bad that we can only find 24,000 genes when Solero can find 35,000 genes or whatever, yeah? And Insight has 100,000 genes, yeah? <laughs> it, that did color me for some of the later things, for example, with Encode, where I've, You've got to stick by the data analysis quite. You've got to, you've got to say to yourself, you've got to have a good talking to yourself before you kind of open the box and you look at it. You've got to say to yourself, okay, you know, which things of my analysis am I confident about? Which things am I going to question if, if the result doesn't look like how it looks like? I wish I'd stuck to my guns. Michelle and I had stuck to our guns a little bit harder there. We were closer to the money on our on our first analysis, far closer than the, the, the initial draft paper. And it has an awful phrase, like something like, we can find confident evidence of up to 26,000 genes and you know, exploratory evidence up to 35,000. I mean, you know. But the fold-out's kind of interesting because um, you know, we were putting together a paper and the hardcore analysis group, and, whatever, and there's this another awful bit in that paper, by the way, is evidence for horizontal gene transmission. We've got shoved in at the end. Again, you know, we got much better at doing this process of checking things, you know, of not having these sort of last minute, oh my God, I found the most amazing thing ever, uh, uh, thing coming in. But anyway, he came around and then Francis said, Francis in one of these meet, uh, phone calls said, we need a poster. And we need, to, we need a poster and I want to have a poster with every gene in the genome on the poster. Now, it's quite hard to, it's quite hard, you know, you can't do this by hand. Yep, you can't do it by hand. Uh, so, and it's quite, it's quite hard to do. It's actually quite hard to do good layout. It's hard to automate good layout of these things. Um, and so, uh, so it's huge. And so, eventually I said, well, I can program I can, I can write PostScript. And so I wrote a system to write these posters. And that's why I took a photo, because I love when I see it. Because I don't think anybody appreciates the level of detail. It's one of the more complicated, no, it's not the most complicated algorithm, but I had to use my dynamite programming language to write a very specific model to get the layout to look aesthetically correct, yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, so afterwards, I can, I'll go to the corridor and I'll point out all the little things that the algorithm has to do to get this lovely sort of shape in the, in the, really cool, uh, the uh, so, so yeah, there, there I am, you know, writing some layout, postscript layout program. And uh, I can remember doing this vividly because this, this, you know, the, the production timelines of this had to be earlier than some of the other ones so that the right. fold outs would happen and stuff like that. And so I, um, I had to, uh, and I worked with an artist here at NHGRI, Daryl Leacher. And so in the middle of having all these other deadlines, I had another you know, deadline, which was producing posters. 
that people like the look of. Um, uh, so I'm very proud of those posters uh, at the end of the day. I certainly had the feeling that we hadn't, the draft wasn't anywhere near the end of the human genome. It was, you know, it was, it was, it was you know, I knew how messy it was and I knew how, how, how this, w did, we couldn't leave it like that, basically. So that's one thing. At the same time, there was a whole thing about the mouse genome um, going at the same time. It's very interesting there because, of course, there was this whole business that whole genome shotgun wouldn't work, and then suddenly the public, Eric, kind of landed threw himself into a complete um, 180 and said, oh, no, whole genome shotgun is totally fine for mouse. Um, and, you know, it shows that Eric is smart. It also shows that he will set his sail. He will change his mind on a sixpence um, uh, uh, when, uh, when necessary. Okay, that, all that set aside, so the, there's a kind of theme of genomes, and the, the mouse paper, the mouse assembly was better, the mouse gene set was better, the analysis was better, we, we knew what we were doing better across the board there. And then by the time we got to chicken, for example, we were, it was, you know, we were like, I mean, there were problems with the chicken genome because of these microchromosomes, um, but kind of how one thought about doing the analysis was, was now becoming really a, a, a much more structured uh, process in many ways. So that, that, there was that theme. But the, so the, it was also very clear that, clear that there were going to be two threads afterwards. I mean, Anish Yarai said this, but also it was clear inside of Sanger as well. So one of them was human variation, that map, that, that ends up with a thousand genomes. And the other one is basically beyond protein coding genes, right? So what is beyond protein coding genes? And I was interested in both, but because of Ensemble being so focused on annotation, I really felt that the, you know, the thing I should throw myself into was the you know, stuff beyond protein coding genes. And so that, of course, ends up being the ENCODE project. So you have the bit before the ENCODE project, which is, what should we do, and how big should it be, and, 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 and all of that. So we had those meetings. Um, and I think something that people sort of, again, forget it at that time, is that we really didn't have good technologies for studying <laughs> genomes, the human genome at scale. So this was in the epic period of arrays, microarrays, and then tiling arrays. They were awful. You know, you never, you never, they were just, you know, they were not, you know, some people are nostalgic for them, but I am not nostalgic for them. They are, they, I mean, they, if, if, if that was the only way you could do things, and as in ENCODE, as in, in the first ENCODE, that would be the only thing you could do. But they were, they were absolutely awful. Batch effects all over the place, completely impossible to compare between platforms. So the first ENCODE, it was clear that this technology was not, was not going to scale across the entire genome, tiling array technology. It was clear that we didn't know what we should even be measuring. Lots of people had different ideas. So I think that you know the right decision was not to try and do genome-wide things, uh, but to instead concentrate on one percent of the human genome, which was this one percent project, and for everybody to do it. But we also were bringing in a completely different community of people. So all of these sort of transcriptional cell biologists, chromatin people, this sort of stuff. Um, and so there was also a sort of big social thing going on about this. And I think it's right, I mean, it's interesting. So are these very big international consortia the right ways of exploring and doing these things? One, you know, there's post hoc justification because these things, this is the way things happen. It's, le it's far less clear cut what is the right structures for these things. However, that one should do it was very clear cut. I mean, you, you know, that scientifically one should go and work out what was going on in the rest of the genome yeah, uh, was, was very important. So in code one, so I can't quite remember quite how, so Ian Dunham from the Sanger was one of the projects that were funded by NHGRI in ENCODE 1. 
And we were involved partly because of ensemble and maybe, uh, maybe for the genes as well through that, through Sanger or something like that. Anyway, I turned up at all the meetings. It's probably the most important thing, thing to mention here. And in ENCODE 1, it was, decide, it was very unclear about how we should talk about the results. And so there was a decision that there were going to be five different papers. This was an awful decision. But, you know, it was, it was cat herding and with, not with cats, with lions. They really didn't <laughs> want to get on. They, everybody had their own view. Everybody was jostling for position. So you had five different sort of things and therefore five different analysis groups. And I think I did one, of, that's right, around comparative genomics with Elliot Margulies, who was here at NHGRI, intramural. Um, and anyway, it was just a big mess, basically. Now, how, oh, I'm buzzing. Let me just have a little check that. Okay, cool. Um, um, so it was a big, big old mess um, uh, for these five things. And probably the most important thing, which the re we sent them in to review at the same time. So two things about this. So somehow, I think I became chair because of my experience with both the human and the mouse um, genome papers. Francis appointed me, basically, as chair of the analysis group. And I ran these phone calls. I was used to this now. Um, and I obviously had the computational smarts. But the, the, there were a lot of people who really didn't, you know, I didn't know everything. I, I didn't know a lot about chromatin. I didn't know a lot about quite a few things there. I mean. On the flip side, they didn't necessarily know about computational techniques and things like that. So it was, a, it, was, it was very interesting kind of just trying to manage all of these people. And as we put to try to put together these five papers, I mean, there was an awful moment where there was a forced marriage of two groups to lead one of the papers, John Stamalopoulos and Aninja Dutta. And for example, I had to effectively chair a four-hour phone call where we went through the ordering of the authors for that paper. We went down to sort of the, you know, I can't remember, like the 10th, you know, number 10 in the list before we went into alphabetical or whatever, whatever, and then the, the last thing. And I, I, I had never really been, ex I hadn't myself been exposed to that level of um, distrust between scientists on writing papers and things like that, and all, all of that. It was, quite, it was quite novel for me to see all of this. So, so we had those five papers. The science, it was, the, you know, it was all over the shop. It was very clear to everybody, you know, every time you did statistical analysis, you had this massive lab effect. So experiments clustered by lab more than they clustered by, um, you know, any other feature. Right. This, is, this is, you know, it's actually very, very common on lots of microarrays. I mean, you know, so lots of microarrays have the same aspect. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't like we were awful. It was, well, and we were pretty bad. But, but it was, um, um, it was a, a, feature, a feature, it was an aspect of the platform that, you know, people didn't really like talking about, including in gene expression. So AFI arrays and Illumina arrays, if you took them, you clustered them, you would, you would cluster by array before you clustered by uh, anything else. And also, the experimental design was also awful in the sense that um, people would have been given freedom to do experiments on the cell lines they wanted to do them on that they could make work, rather than having any sense of a common cell line. So we could also not really do comparison. We didn't have anything that looked like a good matrix of comparisons. So anyway, the reviewers unsurprisingly read this and so said it was crap. <laughs> so it came back with, you know, effectively, this is awful, um, was, was the, you know, what is going on? And in particular, I think the thing that particularly annoyed the reviewers at that time was that, you know, paper two says something and paper four says something. And when you read these paragraphs, they are in conflict with each other. You know, and it's OK to have two papers from two different groups saying that, but, but not two papers that are coming off the same data sets or supposedly coordinated. So you go work it out. So then we had an awful kind of meeting where I chaired the analysis group. And I basically 
I think I had talked to Francis or Francis and Eric together. And I said, well, look, obviously, we've got to have only one analysis like the genome papers. And obviously, that's the only way through it. And we've got all these problems. We've got to chalk out a whole bunch of these things. We're not going to be able to talk about everything that everybody can talk about because some of it's just not, it's not solid enough for us to be able to talk about the things that we had hoped one could talk about, but you can't. So I kind of agreed that with people here. Maybe that was more with Eric than with Francis. And then I went into a, a, a huge meeting with everybody there, and basically I talked them to death um, uh, so that the only answer left on the table was one paper. And so then we spent another year or something putting together this one paper. It was, it was like the march from Moscow. It was really not, the, you know, not a nice experience at all. Um, and, but we did, and the paper's pretty, you know, it's a bit, I, I see it very similar to the draft human genome paper. So it's not a good paper. It is the first paper that tries to do a number of those things at that scale. Perhaps a bit unlike the draft human genome, actually the take home message is we don't have the right technologies. No. But interesting enough, you know, after all of this hiatus, uh, around this, what actually had happened was that Selexa had come online and was this period being brought up by Illumina, I guess. And it was very, very clear that, or it was very clear that there was a completely new option on the table that could scale incredibly well, which is rather than using tiling arrays, use sequencing as your readout. And I remember then writing people, it's a question about what encode two should be and whether it should be whole genome or not. And again, I, I think if you were, if you just took the results of ENCODE 1 at face value, you'd say, <laughs> you must be kidding. This is not going to work out. You know, we've got bad enough batch effects. At 1%, it's just it's just going to be impossible. Um, but there was this, you know, enough of this new technology had come out to, um, to persuade people it was doable. And so lots of people wrote, I mean, the grants for ENCODE 2 very much with a, well, plan A is tiling arrays, but as soon as we can go to plan B, we'll go to plan B. And in fact, by the time the grants were awarded, everybody had gone to already to plan B, which was do it with Illumina Selexa readout. Um, and that was much better. And the other good thing between ENCODE 1 and ENCODE 2 is I think I had, a, because of the experience of the of pulling together the paper. I mean, I had saved the projects. I, well, not I, sort of like an individual, but pulling this together had s prevented a project, the project looking like a complete disaster, to it looking like, you know, a, a success of some sorts, you know. So I had got the trust a lot more. I wonder when all of these histories come out. But I, you know, I got the trust a lot more of NHGRI project staff, so Lee's, mm -hmm. Feingold, and Peter Good. And I think they, you know, they had a lot of people pushing lots of different opinions on them about how to structure things and how to do things. And so, so I became a stronger voice in that. And one of the things which I was kind of happy and proud about was not only justifying in code two, but um, dealing with uh, saying we must have common cell lines. We must have a core set of cell lines that you must do these experiments on. And those were called tier zero, tier one, and stuff like that. There were six of them um, uh, we, we chose. And that made that, that ENCODE 2 was much, much better designed. So the sort of fundamental experimental design of ENCODE 2 was better. We then also had learned about the QC process better. Um, and so we were at least trying to address QC up front. Though, in fact, we, I don't think that really came to fruition until ENCODE 3, realistically. Uh, but at least we were. I mean, we were much, much better. We were in a completely different space from where, from the first ENCODE. Um, so ENCODE 2 was good, um, actually. And although there was, um, you know, still people rubbing. So also all the social stuff that had gone wrong in ENCODE 1, effectively, some people had just got so pissed off they didn't bid for ENCODE 2. So that's 
one way of solving this problem. But also people had sort of calmed down a little bit and known where people are coming from, just understood each other a little bit better more. So although there was still jostling about the PIs and about who was doing what, who was in charge and stuff like that, and who, whose asset was the most important or whose viewpoint was the most important, it was a much more collegiate uh, process. Yes, uh, the, the consortium acted like a consortium far better. We had a very functional, I think, analysis group. Um, but that was saved for sure by two individuals. So Ian Dunham and Anshul Kunjai. So Ian Dunham w was proved at Sanger, and Sanger made an awful decision, an absolutely crazy decision, where they sort of s they cut about 20% of the institute out. And they, they sort of pretended that it was not, that it was strategic rather than quality. And because of that, there's lots of people who weren't you know, weren't tremendously good who were cut out of Sanger when 20% got lost. Two really, really excellent people were cut. One was Ian Dunham, and the other one was Stefan Beck. I, you know, I, I do not understand why somebody didn't say, oh, for God's sake, guys, let's, you know, just, these guys are the guys that, so they, uh, you know, it was crazy. And it meant that Sanger didn't still, you know, didn't have the depth of functional studies on the genome for a long period, and they had to rebuild it. Anyway, so Ian had kind of got a, effectively a, a redundancy package from Sanger, a very nice redundancy package. He could go wherever he goes. And he was being interviewed to go for, for um, institute directors. People were trying to court him to do all sorts of different things. But Ian's a, he's a great guy. And two things about it, he was very, he didn't really want to move his family. So he, he wanted to be in the Cambridge area, so that was quite a driver. Uh, and the second thing is he didn't actually, he doesn't actually want to be the person having to be the salesman and the justifying of the money and the, all of that. He just wants to do the science far more. So he came with me and he said, I want to, he was also an experimentalist, he said, I want to learn more bioinformatics. Could I use my redundancy money to work in your lab? And I was like, <laughs> you know. So Ian, had been the supervisor of my um, um, journal clubs, you know, when I was a PhD student at Sanger. I mean, you, you know, he's 15 years my senior. He is extremely clever, wise. It was very odd to think that he, so I said, sure, you fine. <laughs> great, come along, <laughs> feel free. Come play with ENCODE, you know, learn Perl, do what, you know, you know, it's fine for you to be there. Yeah? And then when ENCODE 2 came around, um, actually, we argued for deliberate funding of this analysis group. And I said to Ian, why don't you, you know, why don't you do this? Why don't you be the person who makes all of this happen with me? We'll go and do it together. We worked enough together. And he said, yes, thank the Lord. Um, so he and I, or, and, and it was far more him, organized the analysis meetings, though on the phone, you know, it's, I'm the talker, uh, chit chat, you know, all of that kind of thing. So I'm definitely the front man uh, for, the, for the Ian and Ewan show, as it were. And of course, our names are very close. Lots of people can even keep our names straight as well. So they would they'd call me Ian and uh, forget. I mean, it's quite, you know, it's all sort of funny uh, at some level. So we were doing quite well at doing this organization, not perhaps as well as the Thousand Genomes Project, but we did have more complex data. But then we had to run, we really wanted to run everything through a standard pipeline with good QC and everything else. And we just couldn't persuade people to do it in a way between the different groups. And there was this great graduate student that was Seraphim's graduate student that had somehow got attached to, um, he was at Stanford, and I, I, I don't think Mike Snyder had moved to Stanford at that point, called Anshul. Uh, yeah, that's right. It was, um, look, oh, he runs DNA Nexus now. Uh, I can really visualize him. Uh, he is German, Anna. I'll have to find his name. Anyway, he was somehow between Arna and Seraphim, Anshul was. 
And Anshul basically put his hand up and said, well, I'll run this, I can do this, I'll run all these things. And so Anshul created a standardized pipeline for the major chip seek data sets. Um, and coupled with that is we had this legend of um, uh, non-parametric statistics called Peter Bickle. And I'd met Peter in Oxford, no, not in Oxford, in Cambridge, when he was coming over from, so he is a COPS prize winning statistician. He's, you know, you know, people, statisticians don't quite bow to him, but, you know, he is a, ma yeah, he is a major force in non-parametric statistics. And he's a charming guy, lovely, absolutely lovely. And when I first met him in, in Cambridge, um, he wanted, it was around in Code 1, and he wanted to talk to me about this and that. And I wanted to, and he'd done something around genome heterogeneity. And, I, you know, it was like getting, he was very tolerant of me asking stupid questions. Because I, a stupid question, you know, it's like, I don't understand what these things mean. How does this thing mean? Yeah, work here. Um, and so we brought in the Bickle group as part of this analysis group. And that was really great. And there's, so the Bickle group, group developed the statistics. Anshul ran, made a pipeline. Ian corralled all the experimentalists with their metadata to, to, to stuff. I was the ringmaster on this analysis phone call to make this work out. So I was, yeah, so in code two worked far better from my perspective. And by this time, I'd done a lot of genome paper stuff like that. So I'd also kind of <laughs> really wanted this ENCODE 2 paper not to be the mess that the ENCODE 1 was. And so we structured it better. We built up to it better. We then went into this slightly surreal business, because it was very clear we were presenting at meetings. You can see the data that we would be making a publication. And so we, so we sort of had both nature and science come to us to say that. And so we, we had a whole kind of, well, what can you do for us uh, sort of thing. And basically, nature pulled out all the stops. And so we had, you know, epic amounts of, of print space. We had the main paper. We had other papers. We got them to do dynamic, all sorts of things, which I think was really good. Um, so it, it's with some regret <laughs> that this whole 80% function thing kind of blew up. It was always a question inside of the consortium. So the, the definition was to find the functional elements in the human genome. And so you, you end up sort of circling around the definition of function, yeah? And you can have a long, old debate about this. And there's stuff that we measure that you can measure things on the genome sort of doing or being done to it, depends on your perspective. And pragmatically, that was most of what ENCODE was. It was measurements of things on the genome, biochemical things. And then the question is whether you call that biochemical activity and then reserve the word function for something else, or you, or you use the word function for this. And this debate went on and on and on inside of the consortium. And there were a group of people who were much happier with the word biochemical activity, some of which have function. And there were a group of people who were very keen that that had a, a too controlling view of the word function. So, uh, so t you, you need to talk to Tom Gingeris and John Stamenopoulos. They are the, the uh, uh, when we observe biological, biochemical things happening on the genome, we can't just dismiss them because we don't understand them. Is, is that perspective. And there's this other perspective, which is lots of things can happen, and they can happen thermodynamically and stuff like that. So you can't just say, because things happen, they're important. Yeah. So this debate went on and on and on. And as we closed into the paper, we actually had to use a phrase. And my regret, so we did a phone call about this. I got everybody to discuss it. My regret was not to have a formal vote, because a lot of people think there's a, one of these slightly alternative histories where I solely came up with the phrase biochemical function rather than it being a consortium thing. And it would be much better 
I mean, maybe we did record those phone calls. I wonder if we did. Um, uh, it'd be much, much better to have um, to have about reproducible reproducibility of biochemical events gets mapped into Peter Bickle's statistics, runs through Anshul's pipeline, and you then discover that an awful lot of the genome fulfilled this criteria. And people shouldn't be, and I, you know, when I started presenting this, I said, you don't be surprised. You know, transcription from this perspective is, you know, is absolutely there as one of these reproducible events. And not only transcription as in making RNA, but the passage of the polymerase across the DNA and the histone modifications that get deposited as that happens. And there is something weird to say, oh, you know, H3K36 isn't functional. You know, there's something, there's something very odd about, you know, taking the very hardcore extreme, which is it's got to be under evolutionary selection. Okay, so there's a final group of people, yeah, which is it's got to be under evolutionary selection. Yeah, there's a, there's a sort of this complete sort of transition from these people, if it's not in the selection, yeah, yeah it's not useful, to if I can measure it, I, I, I don't want it off the table. And then there's a group of people that basically, there was, there was a middle group. This middle group is sort of the Barbara. This is the um, Chris Ponting. Uh, obviously, Dan Grau is like to the left of this group over here. Um, then there's this group, which is Barbara Wald and, and um, uh, a bunch of people who, who accept that there's things that when, that there's probably more than, than what we can detect by, by pure selection message, but wants to have a very core high bar for the, for the use right. of the word function. And then you get to Tom Gingeris and John Staminopoulos, who's like, you know, the mistake of molecular biology over the last 30 years has been to um, only talk about the things that, that we understand now. And they always would cite microRNAs and, the, and these things, and how if we hadn't been so closed-minded, you know, lots of things would have been discovered earlier. Um, so, but yeah, the regret here somewhat is, is in an early draft of the paper that I wrote, um, there's more ambiguity of the levels in the abstract and in the, in the main thing. By the time we get to the end, we get less ambiguity. Um, but with a kind of chain of definitions. And then we do have a section which goes through all of this and says, uh, well, if you define it like this, it's this percentage. If you define it like this, it's this percentage. If you define it like this, it's this percentage. We sort of march up the percentages. But you end up with 80%. Um, so so my, my, you know, out of all the things that I arranged for or tried to make happen for in code two, where we got the QC a lot better, the experimental design was a lot better, uh, we did this virtual machine of all our results and stuff like that. It's quite, I find it quite frustrating that this fixation about this phrase and this number <laughs> is the, you know, the biggest <laughs> thing. And actually, I don't think it's the biggest thing scientifically. If you look at how it's being used, it yeah. just it, it gets used routinely fine. But if you look at the kind of next layer of why is it remembered, I. Unfortunately, for better or for worse, this story is a big part of it. And that kind of pisses me off. And if, if I had my time again, I would have uh, done my chess moves in a slightly different way. And you know, maybe I would have insisted on a different phrase, which would, might have been biochemical activity. At the very least, I would have got the whole consortium to vote very explicitly. So at the very least, it would be very clear that we're all in it together. Because um, there was a period when Dan Grau kind of exploded, where a lot of people said, well, it's not, nothing to do with me. Ewan wrote the paper. I'm like, oh, for God's sake. You know, we argued about this phrase for a long time. You can't, you can't walk away from it like that. And because, but I'm, I'm in the, I'm most comfortable with using the word biochemical activity for the broader thing a substantial amount of which we believe has cellular function or something like that would be would probably be my my optimal phraseology and uh, i should find the early drafts of the paper where there's where where one tries to transmit more ambiguity of this percentage number um, but i don't have 
sympathy with this hardcore end of people who think, you know, if it's these people, I think are nuts. Uh, so the the group of people who thinks that I don't know that everything that comes from a transposon is not relevant is, I mean, they're they're a bit loopy, basically. And I'm sure they wouldn't. I'm sure I'm characterizing their position a little bit. They wouldn't say that. But I think they have this very very strong view that it's all about evolution. And as soon as you think about other things like cancer, for example, cancer would be a great example. So there's substantial deregulation of all sorts of different things. And of course, you want to know whether MYC binds here or not. Even if it's not under selection, if the MYC binding gives rise to cancerous cells, yeah. You know, you, you really want to know it. Now, do I call it function or not? I don't know. Do I want to know where it is, understand it, measure it, characterize it? For sure. Yeah. If we just leave aside the function bit. So, yeah, have I learned? Yeah, and then it was, I mean, it was, I found it personally very, very difficult when Dan Grau and some people really laid into me on the internet. And this, and some people still do. And I've, you know, I thought I had thick skin, but I didn't. Now I have thick skin, because now I look at some things that are written about me, and I'm like, well, clearly you don't know me. You've kind of got this voodoo doll person, which is you and Bernie, and you enjoy sticking pins into him. You know, fine. You know, I'm not. I'm not even going to try and debate because <laughs> well, you know, what on earth is the point to persuade you that there was? You, you know, you you're so locked into a mindset where I'm the antichrist. I, I'm not. I'm just not going to uh, attempt to uh, uh, untangle it for you. And it has given me insight when people attack other scientists passionately, or politicians. It's given to me an insight that, you know, most of the time, it's very unlikely that people really hold the extreme positions that, um, that they're, they're said to have done by other people. It's, it's, especially if people are clever, I mean, or intelligent, they're, they won't, you know, I think people are, when people sort of, this process of creating these sort of um, caricatures of people is much more about how people want to frame the debate than right. really about you know, understanding what is going on. And uh, uh, yeah. But it, as you can see, I have a lot of kind of regret because I feel like I did lots of things right in Go2. It's my best, my best thing. My best run consortium, and it's sort of marred. It has this really bad end of life taste uh, right at the end because of this. And the the interesting thing about Dan Grant is that is so Des Higgins, who used to be at the EBI, was a really well, not a friend, but early Dan was an early phylogeneticist, tree builder, all of this sort of thing, which is why why he's into this, and he and. Des knows him well, you know, well enough to have beers whenever they're on a conference together. So it was quite interesting talking to Des about Dan. And you know, Dan clearly holds hard positions. And it, I mean, I, I kind of, I, I understand the passion that scientists bring to intellectual purity of, of all sorts of different things. And so there's a part of me that thinks, oh, you know what, if I just have a beer with Dan Grau, um, you know, we'll, we'll leave friends. You know, if he can have beers with Des Higgins, you know, there's a kind of transitive beer having process that uh, that says that this, 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 this should work out. Um, and I, you know, there's part of me that's tempted, and then I just think, oh come on, your life is too short. And and he has made such a thing with me on the other side that I just don't think he could come to like me. Uh, so I kind of mentally said to myself, oh, you know, you've just got to forget about it. You just, you know, I can't make everybody like me, which is, if I have a, one of my failings is I, I kind of want everybody to get along and everybody to, to be happy and, 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 uh, and stuff like that. And uh, it, it, it's regret, regrettable. But yes, I've said this, you know, Twitter and blogs and stuff like that. We don't online criticism, we don't have constructive online criticism is hard. And, uh, you know, it degenerates very, very quickly into um, extreme positions. And uh, I've actually tried to make sure that I am not someone who feeds that.
Um, but it's, it's quite interesting because sometimes you can get, I mean, same problem with email, which is, you know, never write an angry email until you've at least slept on it. Right. Um, but Twitter, you know, moves that ability to go from anger to tweet in uh, in a in a very uh, quick thing, yeah. and and also the other the other thing I think the thing which perhaps I didn't my antennae were tuned in a slightly different way was that of course over in the U.S. the junk DNA thing is wrapped up in the um, creationism right. uh, debate, design. Design, intelligent design, all of that, and and I actually think that that has made some of the people who are the kind of adamant, there's lots of junk DNA people, they close their eyes to data. They, they can't, I mean, it's, it's slightly weird. I've had some of these inter interchanges. And of course, from my perspective, you know, creationism is class A bonkers. I mean, you, you, you know, it's, 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 it, it's in the, it's in the non-science zone. Yes, we've got to work out how to educate these people. But it's a, it's a completely different class of discussion from this discussion, which is, you know, I've seen this, I've done this. So you, how, 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 how has it happened that these things have emerged over evolution? But for some people, they see every, they see the support or the fact that creationists use these statements as indicating that they've got to attack. Right. This, 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 this science is incredible. Yeah, this, you know, something. And... And um, I was actually reassured, you know, there were two, two key moments because people were kind of laying in Twitter, blogs, and Facebook as well. So there's a whole Facebook kind of thing. Um, and there you're, it's a web of friends kind of process, yeah? So what have you. And so somebody was really going at it with Mike Eisen and stuff like that. And then I, not Mike was, Mike was pretty, Mike was annoyed that, the consortium had so much nature publicity. That was Mike's main beef. Um, but other people were annoyed about this other thing. And so I joined in that Facebook thing and said, you know, you know, just to make sure, you know, this is the part in the paper, whatever, whatever. And I said something which was, I don't know, something about how, you know, this is being quite personally difficult for me to hear so, so many people who don't know me really vilify me. Uh, and and I, I give Mike quite a lot of credit that both in that Facebook thing and in Twitter, he said, look, you know, I don't like encode for this. I don't like it for that. I don't like it for the other. But you and Bernie is neither an idiot, nor, uh, nor should he get kind of, you know, whacked around like this. And that was nice of him, actually. Well, it's not nice of him. That shows, you know, that's the right attitude to have, yeah. Uh, um, and I, I've got a lot of time for Mike. Not everybody has time for Mike. I'm sure Francis Collins, Francis doesn't have time for Mike. Um, uh, but, but I think it, fundamentally he's got, he's got a strong, you know, he matches his passion.